Chapter thirty four of the Lamplighter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. The Lamplighter by Maria Susanna Cummins. Chapter thirty four. A course of days composing happy months. Wordsworth. Mrs. Warren's pleasant boarding house was the place chosen by Emily for her own and Gertrude's winter home. And one month from the time of Mr. Graham's return from New York, his country house was closed. He, with his wife, Isabel, and Kitty, were on their way to Havre, Mrs. Ellis gone to enjoy a little rest from care with some cousins at the eastward, and Mrs. Prime established as cook in Mrs. Warren's household, where all the morning she grumbled at the increase of duty she was here called upon to perform, and all the evening blessed her stars that she was still under the same roof with her dear young ladies. Although ample arrangements were made by Mr. Graham, and all sufficient means provided for the support of both Emily and Gertrude, the latter was anxious to be once more usefully employed, and therefore resumed a portion of her school duties at Mr. W.'s. Much as Emily loved Gertrude's constant presence, she gladly resigned her for a few hours every day, rejoiced in the spirit which prompted her exertions, and rewarded her with her encouragement and praise. In the undisturbed enjoyment of each other's society, and in their intercourse with a small but intelligent circle of friends, they passed a season of sweet tranquillity. They read, walked, and communed, as in times long past. Together they attended lectures, concerts, and galleries of art. As they stood before the works of a master's hand, whether in the sculptured marble or the painted canvas, and Emily listened while Gertrude, with glowing eyes and a face radiant with enthusiasm, described with minuteness and accuracy the subject of the pieces, the manner in which the artist had expressed in his work the original conception of his mind, the attitudes of figures, the expression of faces, the colouring of landscapes, and the effect produced upon her mind and heart by the thoughts which the work conveyed. Such was the eloquence of the one, and the sympathising attention of the other, that, as they stood there, in striking contrast, forgetful of all around, they were themselves a study, if not for the artist, for the observer of human nature, as manifested in novel forms, and free from affectation and worldliness. Then, too, as in their daily walks, or gazing upon the glories of a brilliant winter's night, Gertrude, enraptured at the work of the great master of the universe, poured out without reserve her soul's deep and earnest admiration, dilated upon the gorgeousness of a clear sunset, or in the sweet hour of twilight, sat watching the coming on of beautiful night, and lighting of heaven's lamps. Then would Emily, from the secret fountains of her largely illumined nature, speak out such truths of the inner life as made it seem that she alone were blessed with the true light, and all the seeing world sat in comparative darkness. It was a blissful and an improving winter which they thus passed together. They lived not for themselves alone. The poor blessed them, the sorrowful came to them for sympathy, and the affection which they both inspired in the family circle was boundless. Gertrude often recurred to it, in her after-life, as the time when she and Emily lived in a beautiful world of their own. Spring came and passed, and still they lingered there, loath to leave a place where they had been so happy. And nothing at last drove them from the city, but a sudden failure in Emily's health, and Dr. Jeremy's peremptory command that they should at once seek the country air as the best restorative. Added to her anxiety about Emily, Gertrude began to feel much troubled at Willie Sullivan's long silence. No word from him for two or three months. Willie could not have forgotten or meant to neglect her. That was impossible. But why this strange suspension to their correspondence? She tried, however, not to feel disturbed about it, and gave all her care to Emily, who now began indeed to require it. They went to the seaside for a few weeks, but the clear and bracing atmosphere brought no strength to the blind girl's feeble frame. She was obliged to give up her daily walks. A continued weariness robbed her step of its elasticity, and her usually equal spirits were subject to an unwanted depression, while her nervous temperament became so susceptible that the utmost care was requisite to preserve her from all excitement. The good doctor came frequently to see his favorite patient, but finding on every visit that she seemed worse instead of better, he at last ordered her back to the city declaring that Mrs. Jerry's front chamber was as cool and comfortable as the little stivied-up apartments of the crowded boarding-house at Nahant, and there he should insist upon both her and Gertrude's taking up their quarters, at least for a week or two, at the end of which time, if Emily had not found her health, he hoped to have leisure to start off with them in search of it. 
Emily thought she was doing very well where she was, was afraid she should be troublesome to Mrs. Jeremy. Don't talk about trouble, Emily. You ought to know Mrs. Jerry and me better by this time. Come up tomorrow. I'll meet you at the cars. Good-bye. And he took his hat and was off. Gertrude followed him. I see, doctor, you think Emily is not so well. No, how should she be? What with the sea roaring on one side, and Mrs. Fellow's babies on the other? It's enough to wear away her strength. I won't have it so. This isn't the place for her. And do you bring her up to my house tomorrow? The babies don't usually cry as much as they have today, said Gertrude, smiling. And as to the ocean, Emily loves dearly to hear the waves rolling in. She sits and listens to them by the hour together. Knew she did, said the doctor. Shan't do it. Bad for her. It makes her sad, without her knowing why. Bring her up to Boston, as I tell you. It was full three weeks after the arrival of his visitors, before the popular physician could steal away from his patients to enjoy a few weeks' recreation in travelling. For his own sake, he would hardly have thought of attempting so unusual a thing as a journey. And his wife, too, loved home so much better than any other place, that she was loath to start for parts unknown. But both were willing, and even anxious, to sacrifice their long-indulged habits for what they considered the advantage of their young friends. Emily was decidedly better, so much so as to view with pleasure the prospect of visiting West Point, Catskill, and Saratoga, even on her own account. And when she reflected upon the probable enjoyment the trip would afford Gertrude, she felt herself endowed with new strength for the undertaking. Gertrude needed change of scene and diversion of mind almost as much as Emily. The excessive heat of the last few weeks, and her constant attendance in the invalid's room, had paled the roses in her cheeks, while care and anxiety had weighed upon her mind. The late improvement in Emily, however, and the alacrity with which she entered into the doctor's plans, relieved Gertrude of her fears, and as she moved actively about to complete the few preparations which were needed in her own and her friend's wardrobe, her step was as light, and her voice as gladsome, as her fingers were busy and skillful. New York was their first destination, but the heat and dust of the city were almost insufferable, and during the one day which they passed there, Dr. Jeremy was the only member of the party who ventured out of the hotel, except on occasion of a short expedition which Mrs. Jeremy and Gertrude made in search of dress caps, the former lady's stock being still limited to the old yellow and the lilac and pink neither of which she feared would be just the thing for Saratoga. The doctor, however, seemed quite insensible to the state of the weather. So much was he occupied with visits to some of his Esculpian brethren, several of whom were college classmates, whom he had not seen for years. He passed the whole day in the revival of old acquaintances and associations, and a number of these newly found but warm-hearted friends, having presented themselves at the hotel in the evening, to be introduced to Mrs. Jeremy and her traveling companions. Their parlor was enlivened until a late hour by the happy and cheerful conversation of a group of elderly men, who, as they recalled the past, and dwelt upon the scenes and incidents of their youthful days, seemed to renew their boyish spirits. So joyous was the laughter and excitement with which each anecdote of former times received as it fell from the lips of the spokesman, an office which each filled by turns. Dr. Jeremy had been a great favorite among his circle, and almost every narrative of college days— save those which he himself detailed, bore reference to some exploit in which he had borne a spirited and honorable part. And the three female auditors, especially Gertrude, who was enthusiastic in her own appreciation of the doctor's merits, listened triumphantly to this corroborative testimony of his worth. The conversation, however, was not of a character to exclude the ladies from participating in as well as enjoying it. And Gertrude, who always got on famously with elderly men, and whom the doctor loved dearly to draw out, contributed not a little to the mirth and good humor of the company, by her playful and amusing sallies, and the quickness of repartee with which she responded to the adroit, puzzling, and sometimes ironical questions and jokes, of an old bachelor physician, who from the first took a wonderful fancy to her. Emily listened with delighted interest to a conversation which had for her such varied charms, and shared with Gertrude the admiration of the doctor's friends who were all excited to the warmest sympathy for her misfortune, while Mrs. Jeremy, proud, smiling, and happy, looked so complacent as she sat ensconced in an armchair, 
listening to the encomiums pronounced on her husband's boyhood, that Gertrude declared, as they separated for the night, that she had almost come to the conclusion that the old yellow was becoming to her, and her new caps altogether superfluous. Upon hearing that Dr. Jeremy's party were going up the Hudson the next morning, Dr. Grisworth, of Philadelphia, who had many years before been a student of our good doctors, expressed his satisfaction in the prospect of meeting them on board the boat, and introducing to Gertrude his two daughters, whom he was about to accompany to Saratoga, to meet their grandmother, already established at Congress Hall for the summer. It was midnight before Gertrude could compose her mind, and so far quiet her imagination, which, always lively, was now keenly excited by the next day's promise of pleasure, as to think of the necessity of fortifying herself by sleep, and Emily was finally obliged to check her gaiety and loquacity by positively refusing to join in another laugh or listen to another word that night. Thus condemned to silence, she sunk at once to slumber, unconscious that Emily, usually an excellent sleeper, had in this instance acted solely for her benefit, being herself so strangely wakeful that morning found her unrefreshed and uncertain whether she had once during the night been lulled into a perfect state of repose. Gertrude, who slept soundly until wakened by Miss Graham, started up in astonishment on seeing her dressed and standing by the bedside, a most unusual circumstance, and one which reversed the customary order of things, as Gertrude's morning kiss was wont to be Emily's first intimation of daylight. Six o'clock, Gertie, and the boat starts at seven. The doctor has already been knocking at our door. "'How soundly I have slept!' exclaimed Gertrude. "'I wonder if it's a pleasant day.' Beautiful, replied Emily, but very warm. The sun was shining in so brightly that I had to close the blinds on account of the heat. Gertrude made haste to repair for lost time, but was not quite dressed when they were summoned to the early breakfast prepared for travellers. She had also her own and Emily's trunks to lock, and therefore insisted upon the others preceding her to the breakfast hall, where she promised to join them in a few moments. The company assembled at this early hour was small consisting only of two parties besides Dr. Jeremy's, and a few gentlemen, most of them businessmen, who, having partaken of their food in a business-like manner, started off in haste for their different destinations. Of those who still lingered at the table when Gertie made her appearance, there was only one whom she particularly observed, during the few moments allowed her by Dr. Jeremy for the enjoyment of her breakfast. This was a gentleman who sat at some distance from her, idly balancing his teaspoon on the edge of his cup, he had concluded his own repast, but seemed quite at his leisure, and previous to Gertrude's entrance had won Mrs. Jeremy's animadversions by a slight propensity he had manifested to make a more critical survey of her party than she found wholly agreeable. "'Do pray,' said she to the doctor, "'send the waiter to ask that man to take something himself. I can't bear to have anybody looking at me so when I'm eating.' "'He isn't looking at you, wife. It's Emily that has taken his fancy. Emily, my dear,' "'There's a gentleman over opposite, who admires you exceedingly.' "'Is there?' said Emily, smiling. "'I am very much obliged to him. "'May I venture to return the compliment?' "'Yes, he's a fine-looking fellow. "'The wife here doesn't seem to like him very well.' "'At this moment Gertrude joined them, "'and as she made her morning salutation to the doctor and his wife, "'and gaily apologized to the former for her tardiness, "'the fine color which mantled her countenance, and the deep brilliancy of her large dark eyes, drew glances of affectionate admiration from the kind old couple, and were perhaps the cause of the stranger's attention being at once transferred from the lovely and interesting face of Emily to the more youthful, beaming, and eloquent features of Gertrude. She had hardly taken her seat before she became aware of the notice she was attracting. It embarrassed her, and she was glad when, after a moment or two, the gentleman hastily dropped his teaspoon, rose and left the room. As he passed out, she had an opportunity of observing him, which she had not ventured to do while he sat opposite to her. He was a man considerably above the middle height, slender but finely formed, and of a graceful and dignified bearing. His features were rather sharp, but expressive and even handsome. His eyes, dark, keen, and piercing, had a most penetrating look, while his firmly compressed lips spoke of resolution and strength of will. But the chief peculiarity of his appearance was his hair, which was deeply tinged with gray, and in the vicinity of his temples almost snowy white. This was so strikingly in contrast with the youthful fire of his eye, and the easy lightness of his step, 
that instead of seeming the effect of age, and giving him a title to veneration, it rather enhanced the contradictory claims of his otherwise apparent youth and vigor. "'What a queer-looking man!' exclaimed Mrs. Jeremy, when he had passed out. "'An elegant-looking man, isn't he?' said Gertrude. "'Elegant,' rejoined Mrs. Jeremy. "'What, with that gray head?' "'I think it's beautiful,' said Gertrude. "'But I wish he didn't look so melancholy. It makes me quite sad to see him.' "'How old should you think he was?' asked Dr. Jeremy. "'About fifty, said Mrs. Jeremy. "'About thirty, said Gertrude, and both in the same breath. "'A wide difference,' remarked Emily. "'Doctor, you must decide the point.' "'Impossible. I wouldn't venture to tell that man's age within ten years at least. "'Wife has got him old enough, certainly. "'I'm not sure, but I should set him as low even as Gertrude's mark. "'Age never turned his hair gray. That is certain.' Intimation was now given that passengers for the boat must be on the alert, and all speculation upon the probable age of the stranger, a fruitless kind of speculation, often indulged in, and sometimes a source of vain and endless discussion, was suddenly and peremptorily suspended. End of chapter 34